Thank you for joining us. I'm Lynette Clements, and I'm director of Wallace House here at the University of Michigan. We're home to the Knight Wallace Fellowships for Journalists and the Livingston Awards for Young Journalists. And it's nice to see a full room today and a room full of so many students. Um, we have so much to move through today in such a short amount of time. And so we wanted to start the conversation by just giving some framing information to um, set the parameters for this conversation. As we thought about this event, it was difficult to figure out where we would start the conversation because the topic in front of us is one that in fact has been going on and developing for many years. Um, if you all are like me, it's hard to know where to put our focus right now. That the information, the news is moving so fast, we move week after week from story to story, from crisis to crisis, from despair to outrage, to not knowing where to turn. Um, and sometimes it's important to stop and step back and remember that even if the story at the front of the news has moved forward, the thing that we were talking about one month ago or three months ago or six months ago is still very active and still requires our attention. Um, the video that we just showed was a report a special report done by Maria Elena Salinas, who's moderating our conversation today. That special was produced in 2014. It could just as have easily been produced last month. Uh, and so these issues are still very much in front of us. And we were discussing before we gathered here today that one of the things, the framing for this conversation is, of course, where are we? Um, in the trajectory from the zero tolerance policy. Uh, as we stand here today, there are some 350 children who were separated from their parents who are still not reunited with their parents for a variety of reasons, even though the story has moved ahead. And so we are a program certainly for journalists. We're a program that believes you can use strong journalism to frame important conversations. Um, even if this is not what is leading the news tonight, we hope that this will be a space that you can stay in with us for this moment and that it's something that you will continue to focus on and discuss after this event is over. I'd like to thank our co-sponsors for this event, the Ford School for Public Policy, which is always such a good partner to us and we love being in this space with your students, with your faculty, um, and really bridging public policy and journalism seems to be uh, one of a perfect combination for a good com conversation. Uh, the National Center for Institutional Diversity, we have several of our partners from NCID in the room and they've been instrumental in uh, with us in thinking about how we did outreach for this event. There are so many things happening on campus every day and uh, you could go to events all day every day and never go to class and have a very full, full schedule. And so for our partners who helped us get people to this event for this conversation, we're grateful. The Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, and again for our partners who helped us um, promote this event around campus, the Department of Latin American Studies and the Department of American Culture. Thank you uh, to all of you. Thank you to those. This event is being live streamed, and so though the room is full, we also have people watching us uh, via live stream and, and we thank you for your attention and the time you're spending here with us. As we open it up for discussion and questions, we'll be taking questions and comments from the audience. We also invite those of you who are participating via live stream to uh, submit your comments and questions on Twitter using the hashtag at Wallace House. Uh, and we will be having our Knight Wallace Fellows in the room to help facilitate conversation and to integrate those who, of you who are participating on social media. Um, with that, I'd like to just very quickly turn things over to our panel. Maria Elena Salinas is a Livingston judge and someone that um, I've come to love working with. But uh, I did not want to introduce her today because as I've been made aware, even just in the past hour, there are people who smile when they see me, but almost faint when they see Maria Elena. 
Uh, and, and there are people for whom, if they don't get a picture with her today, their parents may not let them come home for the holidays. And, and so, so I've asked a student uh, to introduce Maria Elena and get our program started. I'd like to turn the podium over to Jose Lujano. He's 26. He's a master of, in his second year of pursuing a master's of public policy here at the Ford School. He comes here from San Jose, California. Like many of you, certainly like me, he um, was the first in his family to finish an undergraduate degree and pursue a master's degree. And uh, he's passionate about the homeless and about creating new conversations to destigmatize homelessness uh, and to focus people on people and not on categories. And I'm so happy that he's agreed to participate in the program. Jose. Thank you, Lynette. For the record, I'm one of those people that would faint. Uh, and I, so, uh, as Lynette said, I'm a second year Master of Public Policy student at the Ford School, and I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to all of you here at the Ford School, uh, to Weill Hall. Um, I have the very, very special privilege of introducing somebody that I've been uh, admiring my entire life. Um, she's a journalist whose professional uh, career spans more than three decades and whose personal commitment to telling the stories of Latinos spans uh, a lifetime. Picture this, it's about 5.30 o'clock and your mom just got home from work. She's tired, exhausted from the long day, and yet she scrambles in the kitchen and makes a warm, comforting meal like she always does. You sit down for dinner, you catch up, uh, you share the stories that are top of mind for that day. Um, and the TV is on in the background. Uh, the local news is finishing up as you complete your meal. And then silence. Uh, your mom uh, turns up the TV and the TV announcer says, Este es un noticiero Univision con Jorge Ramos y María Elena Salinas. which literally translates to this is your evening news program with Jorge Ramos and Maria Elena Salinas. For over 30 years, uh, Maria Elena Salinas did what no other Latina in the United States did so consistently and so passionately. Every evening, millions of us watched her, not because our moms made us, um, <laughs> or because it was what was on in the only other television in the house, uh, but because of the fundamental trust that Maria Elena Salinas was able to establish with her audience. The trust that not only the news was accurate, but that the anchor delivering the news knew her audience stories as if they were her own. The story of a new immigrant to this country working hard to navigate a new society, or a hardworking mom feeding her family and staying current with the major news affecting us. Maria Elena Salinas is a hero to many, myself included, and though she no longer anchors the most watched Spanish language program in prime time, she remains committed to telling stories important to her audience in various different formats. This week, as we celebrate diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout the University of Michigan, it should come to no surprise that we invite Maria Elena Salinas to moderate this distinguished panel of policy experts and journalists in a discussion of our current and historical crisis at the border. Uh, please give a very warm Ford School welcome to Maria Elena Salinas. Thank you so much, Jose. You almost made me cry. And I have a rule that when, you cry, when I'm on camera and I want to cry, I put my head back and I blink and then everything goes back into its place. So then we can get started now. Let's get started. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Wallace House for inviting me, for inviting us to have this very important and timely conversation. Uh, as you saw in the video that we showed right now, it was a one hour special that we reduced to three minutes, but the important thing was to be able to show you who are the people that are crossing the border, the conditions that they live in, the risks that they're taking, um, what UNICEF said, I think the position of the then o Obama government to help us understand that maybe not so much has changed. This is not a new phenomenon. So let me introduce you to um, our incredible panel today, right next to me. Anne Lynn, Associate Professor of Public Policy at Ford School of Public Policy here at the University of Michigan. 
She teaches courses on public policy implementation, gender and politics, qualitative research methods, and immigration. Lynn is currently studying potential immigration policies and the beliefs of American immigrants with a special focus on Arab Americans. Thank you for being here, Anne. Next is Ginger Thompson. Ginger is a senior reporter at ProPublica. ProPublica? ProPublica. Pro uh, previously, <laughs> she spent 15 years as a correspondent with the New York Times. She served as Mexico City Bureau Chief for both the New York Times and the Baltimore Sun. Among her many accolades, she received the prestigious Maria Morse Cabot Award and was part of the team of reporters at the Times that won the Pulitzer Prize in 2000 for the series, How Race is Lived in America. We need that series again yes, right now, Ginger. And next to her, Erin Nelson. Erin is a Knight Wallace Fellow studying the effect of militarization on communities along the US-Mexico border. In June of this year, he ended his five-year tenure as the Rio Grande Valley Bureau Chief for the San Antonio Express News. And am among other things, Aaron has been a correspondent for time and a contributor to the New York Times in Chile. So he speaks Spanish. Hablas español, verdad? Of course, yes. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for being here. Big round of applause, please, for our amazing panel. We're going to begin with the questions, but as Lynette said, we are going to be opening it up for questions in a little while, but we also want anyone that feels that they have a story that would like to share or a comment that they would like to make to feel free to do so. And, and let's begin with the title of this session. We call it Crisis at the Border, but of course it's more like the latest crisis at the border. How did this new crisis come about? Each one of you. Who would like to start? Go ahead. Anne? Um, so what, we're all focused, what we've all been focused on in the last, sorry. Okay. What we've all been focused on most recently, of course, is the family separation policy, which is a policy that really came about because of um, a certain lack of a, of, so it became both of a new approach to immigration enforcement and at the same time also a lack of concern um, about the details, about how that new policy of enforcement would be carried out. And so you might think of it as two things. One, um, if you come to the United States and you are asking for asylum, you can do so legally if you come in through a border entry point. Um, if you come to the United States um, with not from at a place which is not a border entry point, you are su you are considered to be in the U.S. without inspection um, or common in the common parlance illegally. Although it's important to remember that that's a civil term and not a criminal term. At any rate, when you come in and you, if you run across border control and at the border patrol, and at that point you say. Um, I need asylum, I'm escaping conditions in my home country, I need a place to be safe, then um, the Border Patrol asks you a set of questions to establish whether you have a credible fear, um, a, a fear that is believable, that doesn't give you asylum if they decide you do have a credible fear, it just allows you to move on in the process. Um, if you don't have a credible th fear, then you are a subject to deportation because you are in the US without inspection. Um, what the Trump administration has been doing is saying, if you have come across the border, even if you are going to ask for asylum, if you have not come in at a border entry point, then you have crossed illegally, and we are going to try you in court for crossing the border illegally. And since we are going to try you in court, we are going to hold you in jail until we can give you a court date. And while you are in jail, of course, it's an adult jail, and children cannot be with you. And so you are separated from your children, not because we have a policy of separating you from your children, but because we have a policy of imprisoning you until we can find you guilty of crossing the border and deport you. Well, following that same idea, Ginger, Following that same idea, as far as I know, crossing the border without documents is not a crime. It's a civil offense unless you re-enter the country, 
after being deported, then it becomes a, a felony. So why are immigrants being jailed and treated like criminals? So let me just go back one little bit, right? When the president won the election, numbers dropped at the border. Uh, for a little bit of time, fewer numbers of people were crossing the border. And the president was raving about this, you know, that look, I, you know, I come in, I promise to get tough, and people stop coming. Shortly after that, however, when immigrants realized that it was mostly talk and not much was really changing in terms of enforcement at the border, the numbers began to rise again. And when those numbers began to rise, and then there was even a caravan of immigrants that sort of publicly made clear that it was approaching the border, uh, many of them women and children or fathers and children, the president reacted. And the president said, you know, we're going to put a stop to this. We've got, we, we can't let, you know, families come in. He started talking about catch and release, which had been a policy that had been used by previous administrations. We are not going to capture these people and release them so that then they can spend years here working out their asylum claims. And that's where zero tolerance began, right? The president said, we are looking for a way to deter families from thinking they can come here and spend years pursuing asylum. And so he took a measure that went a step further than the Obama administration, and he pulled these families apart. He arrested the adults and charged them for the first time. I mean, immigrants had been prosecuted for entering the border illegally um, in low numbers under Obama. But what he didn't do is separate people from their children during that prosecution. And again, it was an attempt to deter people from coming, right? So that you got one strike, you'd get charged with illegal entry. The second time, you could be put into jail for a long time. That first time, you were treated, it was a misdemeanor crime, and you were released. But if you got charged a second time, then it was a felony, and you could be held for a long time. It, this administration changed that and said, we will prosecute you and, and threaten to put you in jail but not only that, we're going to um, take your children away from you while you're being prosecuted. And so it, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. And, and one of the problems with that is that they didn't keep any record. They just started randomly separating families. And suddenly, when it was time to reunite the families, they didn't know where they were. There was a child in New York with a mother in Seattle. The, the mother didn't know where the child was, and neither did the administration. Uh, Aaron, you were there on the ground. You covered from 2013 to just um, this past June. Uh, what did you see during the time that you were there, and how did it change from 2013 to this past June? Uh, hi. So yeah, in 2013, 2014, we started to see a surge of Central Americans arriving at the southern border, specifically in South Texas. Um, which was significant because for many years the largest group of people arriving at our southern border were Mexicans. And those numbers started to decline in uh, 2008, 9, 10, and by 2014 we see uh, huge numbers of families, uh, children unaccompanied by a parent arriving at the southern border, um, mainly from Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. Um, it was a crisis for Obama as well, they just didn't have the infrastructure to deal with it. Uh, they attempted a uh, similar policy of family detention. Um, they uh, were unsuccessful in doing that. Uh, the Obama administration also tried to uh, export our border or uh, move the border into uh, southern Mexico. So Mexico uh, implemented this southern border plan um, and they started arresting huge numbers of Central Americans. So we didn't really see the numbers of Central Americans decline. It just turned out that Mexicans were apprehending them and not uh, uh, U.S. Border Patrol. Um, but once again, you know, uh, fast forward a few years and we're still seeing the same people fleeing the region, uh, fleeing the same circumstances of violence, of public corruption, uh, of poverty, of uh, uh, joblessness. And uh, these hardline policies have done really very little to, to stop that flow. You told me before, uh, when we were talking about preparing for this session, that what you saw, Aaron, 
it was a change not only in in the way that people were treated, but the way that the Border Patrol was responding to it and the way that they were communicating with the press. Can you explain that to us, please? Well, under the Obama administration, uh, Border Patrol was pretty straightforward with how they communicated the numbers of people they were apprehending, the circumstances in which they were being apprehended. Um, but under Trump, uh, there was a real change in the tenor of the way that they were communicating uh, with the public. So um, by December of 2016, uh, we started seeing uh, CBP officers, those are the men and women that work at the ports of entry, uh, turning people back. Uh, there were people who were crossing the bridges. So when we talk again about the people that are crossing the border and requesting asylum, there's also tens of thousands of people that cross the ports of entry and request uh, uh, credible fear interviews. Um, but CBP officers were turning them back and telling uh, migrants, we don't, we don't have to uh, give you this interview because Trump is our president. Um, they started putting out these uh, press releases of a volatile border, uh, agents under attack, MS-13 gang members pouring across the border. So it starts to change the, the narrative in, in the way uh, that uh, uh, Border Patrol was talking about the border. Now, the, the, the thing about that is that uh, the numbers are, are really at historic lows. I mean, in 2000, we had 1.6 million uh, apprehensions. Uh, and as Ginger mentioned, last year, which was a little bit of an anomaly, we had about 300,000. And this year, it's still going to be below 400,000. So we are at historic uh, low levels. Um, and the border, quite frankly, has never been more secure than it is right now. Uh, but nevertheless, Border Patrol paints a very uh, haunting picture of being overrun and under attack. I, I have a question that's a little bit of a political question. Uh, and the Trump administration said that they were just applying a law that was put in place by the Democrats. Is there such a law put in place by the Democrats that called for the separation of children? Um, there isn't a law. What there is is a court settlement, the Flores settlement. And this, again, predates the Obama administration, but it basically says that children who are, de if children are detained in the course of an immigration case, they should be kept in the least restrictive setting possible. And if possible, not detained in a large scale setting, but placed um, with family or other caretakers. Um, and so that's on one side. And on the other side, um, the Trump administration is saying, so, so to, let me, to let me continue there. Um, so the Trump administration said, well, so here's somebody coming to ask for asylum with their child. We do not, they have crossed the border illegally. Um, you, we are going to detain you because you've broken this law um, and we're gonna send you back. And since a child can't be detained, or children should not be should be detained in the least restrictive setting possible. We can't put them in an adult detention center. Okay, but what happens when these people cross over and they say, "I want an, a, a hearing because I want to ask for asylum"? Then they are refugees, not immigrants. What is the difference, and how should they be treated differently? Well, so the so. This is a wonderful question, Maria Elena, because I think it strikes at something which is a real contradiction um, in our understanding of immigration. Um, we have stories, of course, everybody has a story of the immigrant who comes to the United States, they want to work hard, um, they're fleeing persecution um, in their own country, they're fleeing horrible conditions, and here they come to the United States. But under international law, only if you are fleeing a country where you are personally persecuted, where it's not just, I, you know, there's war, there are bombs, you know, there's corruption, there are gangs, but you are personally targeted, and you are personally targeted because of your race, your religion, your ethnicity, um, your political belief, or your membership in a disfavored social group. Only for those five reasons do we consider you a refugee. Refugees are treated quite differently from immigrants. Um, refugees, there is an international obligation for countries not to send them back. That's not mind you, an international obligation to accept them as permanent residents or citizens in your country. But there is an obligation not to send them back where they could be um, harmed. 
And so the credible fear interview that we've been talking about here is really a border patrol officer's own estimation of whether he or she thinks you are going to be, you, are, you fear the personal persecution because of your race, religion, etc. How about if you're a young Guatemalan or El Salvadoran, Honduras, Honduran who is worried that who left your home because you are afraid of being forced into a gang? Well, be, is that a political persecution? Are you being targeted because but you of your are political being belief? But you are being targeted. But are you being targeted for the right reason? It's well, a very, and, very big, complicated and Obama, thing. And this administration has recently decided that fear of persecution by gangs does not qualify for refugee status, right? Which is a new sort of, um, it's sort of a ramping up, if you will, of the restrictions of who qualifies. The same goes for um, people who seek asylum based on domestic violence. That no longer qualifies, according to the, Obama, uh, the Trump administration for refugee status. When, when all this happened, I think there was a lot of confusion because we heard a lot of noise coming from the administration, coming from um, border patrol agents, and coming from um, journalists also. But then there was one incident that came out of the news that sort of changed everything, and that was broken by ProPublica. ProPublica broke the story of the conditions of the children in the detention center with an audio recording of a little girl crying. I don't know if you all remember that. How did you get that recording? How did ProPublica get that recording? So um, these things happen in kind of weird ways, but I was actually with my significant other driving down Route 95 to see my mother from New York. And we were driving to Maryland, and I get a call from a source. Now, I've been writing about immigration for longer than many of you guys have been alive, and I've, I grew up on the border. So I've, I've been doing this a long time, and I know a lot of people. And um, one of my oldest sources called up and said, there's a tape out there, and it was recorded inside a Border Patrol detention facility. And on this tape, you can hear children wailing who have just been separated from their parents. I have a source who wants to provide this tape to someone in the media, and I suggested that the source provide it to you. And so I wasn't sure what this tape would be. I said, if you can get the tape, I'd be happy to listen to it. I can't promise, because I didn't know what we were talking about. Um, at about 10 o'clock when I'm driving back from my mother's, the tape lands in my cell phone. And I put it onto our car stereo, and we heard the tape. Um, my significant other immediately begins to cry, and I start thinking, OK, how do I confirm that this tape is what it says it is? And this is sort of the, the challenge that journalists like us face. We get a, an amazing piece of information, and we have to authenticate it. I have to make sure that this tape is what I'm being told it is. I need to get this source, who I've never met, to agree to talk to me. The source had put certain conditions on how we could use this tape, including the source wanted parts of the tape edited out, because the source was worried that there was information on the tape that would identify the source, and that that would cause the source to lose their job. Um, and so I had to spend a weekend figuring out that the tape was real. How did we do that? There's a little girl on this tape. If you haven't heard the tape, she's asking a Border Patrol official to make a phone call to her aunt. Please, please let me call my aunt so that she'll know where I am. And she recites this number. So I called the number and found her aunt. Um, and then I had to talk to the source. I had to get the source to talk to me directly so that I could know who the source was and the conditions under which the source recorded this audio, right? Was so the that source I could... someone who worked inside the detention center? I, can't I know we say. can't give the source, but, <laughs> I can't but if they're going to lose their jobs, I can't inquisitive say. minds want to know. Yeah, I know, of course. I can't say. 
But the source, you know, once I figured out who the source was, it was clear to me that the, the, the source was in the position to record such an audio, right? And, and then I had to, um, you know, I had to make sure that um, we authenticated the tape, we, we talked to the source, um, and then, you know, just figuring out how, how, how we could put this forward. Oh, the last thing was the source wanted the tape edited. That's the thing. Source wanted the tape edited, and we said, clearly, we cannot edit the tape because then we'll, we'll be accused of doctoring the tape. And we basically told the source that, look, this is a potentially game-changing piece of information. And there is a risk that if we play this whole tape, that your identity will be discovered. Um, but is this the kind of information that is worth the risk, right? The, the source had clearly recorded this tape with game-changing in mind clearly had reached out to the media because the source wanted something to be done about this policy. And so um, that kind of encouraged the source. I just kind of nudged the source to let us have the whole tape and let us play the whole tape. Right. I'm glad so that, that you explained credible. this because so many people who still believe in that accusation of fake news and yep. they don't know exactly what right. journalists go through to, before yep. they put out any kind of information. Mm -hmm. But you say it was a game changer and it was. It didn't only change public opinion, but it also led to a change in the policy. What were the repercussions? So the tape, the first time we put the tape up, right at the time of the White House briefing that afternoon. So I think the briefing was at like three, and we put the tape online at about quarter to three. And if you, you guys are, you don't have to follow the White House briefings the way that we do, but you can live stream the White House briefing. So in our newsroom, we can watch the White House briefing, and we did. And as we put the, the tape up, the audio up, we could see buzz beginning in the White House briefing room. All the journalists are looking at their cell phones and they're like going, did you, can you hear this? And then we can start, we can start hearing the wailing in the, news, in the White House briefing room. The White House decides to postpone the briefing that day. They pushed it back by half an hour so they could get the DHS secretary to come in and answer questions because they knew there were going to be questions about this tape. You know, it was heard around the world. I mean, the reaction was incredible. ProPublica had more hits on its website than we've had for just about any other story. And two days later, um, the president retreated from the policy. And what I think happened with that tape is that there was a lot of writing about um, zero tolerance, but it was a lot of sort of political conversation about the policy and whether the policy was the right policy. I think those children and their voices sort of drowned out all the political noise, and the only thing anybody could hear anymore were those cries. And even people who thought they might support the, the idea of cracking down at the border and more security at the border didn't think that it should look like that. They didn't think it should look like wailing children. And so when conservatives started to change their feelings about the policy, then I think the president changed his feelings about it. And I think that, that goes to show you just what an important role the, the media plays in all this, especially when you tell stories. When you tell, when you put a face and a name or in this, in this case, a voice um, to what would otherwise be considered just a number, another statistic. Uh, you thought of these immigrants as thousands and thousands and thousands of invaders, and suddenly they're not. Suddenly it's a little girl crying. Or stories, Aaron, that you have told and that you have seen. Was there any particular story that stuck with you during the time that you were covering this border crisis? Or the one before? Oh. Or the one before? <laughs> <laughs> or the one before that? Um, yes, there, there, there are. But I, actually, I, I wanted to say something about uh, what Ginger was talking about. Um, I, I, I don't know that uh, many people recognize that our, our border policies are, are meant to be inhumane. Uh, they're really not meant to 
make it easy for people to get across the border. Uh, it's, it, they're intended to make it as awful as possible. Um, and, and, or even really what the border looks like. So, you know, you have people that are coming up to the border uh, that are claiming asylum uh, or maybe trying to sneak across the border, but they have to do that in these really extraordinary, extreme environments uh, where they have to risk their lives, right? Uh, you know, in the, in the aftermath of September 11th, uh, the, the call to secure the border really began to ratchet up. Um, during the Bush administration, uh, uh, President Bush authorized the building of hundreds of miles of border wall. Uh, there was also a push to hire on thousands of border patrol agents and CBP officers. Uh, today we have uh, 650 miles of border wall. We have 20,000 border patrol agents, 23,000 CBP officers. It makes it the largest law enforcement agency in the country. Uh, you know, there's air and marine patrols, there are ground sensors that detect when somebody's walking in a remote area of the border. We have camera towers, we have hidden cameras, we have a cavalry. Uh, you know, that, that's kind of what our, our border looks like today. Um, so, you know, the, the, the stories of tragedy, uh, I mean, you know, it shouldn't come as any surprise that more or less during the same period of time, uh, almost 7,000 people have died trying to cross the border. And in any other context, that would be a border crisis. But nobody really talks about that all too much, you know. Um, and yes, uh, you know, I spent some time in Central America. Uh, I've spent some time with families of Central Americans who are looking for their loved ones uh, who have disappeared on the trek through Mexico. See, that's the other part of the border policy that nobody talks about too much. Because of how difficult it is to get across the border, uh, it, it really... It, it makes the smuggling of immigrants a very lucrative enterprise. So you have, uh, you have uh, drug cartels that have largely taken over uh, the movement of migrants through Mexico. Uh, and even if somebody's lucky enough to get all the way through Mexico without being beaten or kidnapped, uh, without being sexually assaulted, uh, they get to the border and they're gonna have to pay somebody to get across the border, probably thousands of dollars. Um, and so the, the, the thing that uh, I, I think is often missed or ignored in these conversations is that the people that are coming, they'll ride atop trains, they'll cram themselves into tractor trailers, they'll march through the desert, they'll even risk the possibility of being separated at the border because for them the calculation is uh, you know, a grim future at home uh, or the possibility of maybe making it to the United States and, and uh, offering something better for their family. And from what your research, who are these people that are climbing the trains and, and, and going into trailers and risking their lives to cross here? Are they um, criminals and rapists and drug dealers? Um, they're no. They're no is the answer to that. <laughs> but I think it's they, the people who, as, as both I think Ginger and Aaron have made clear, people are coming not only because, and sometimes not even primarily because, they think a better life waits for them in the United States. They know that if they get to the US, it's not going to be easy. Um, they are running because they're being pushed out, because crime has made it impossible for them to um, have a business, sell, the f sell, their f sell food, um, put their kids in school. They are running because gang members are demanding protection um, if they're going to be able to continue to live in their house, continue to um, work in the market. Um, they are running because they do not have a job and they have no prospects of a job and they cannot figure out how they're going to keep their children alive um, another month. So under those conditions, people endure really extraordinary hardships to get here. Um, and it's difficult, I think, if you go back to that definition of refugee versus immigrant, it's really difficult, I think, to say to somebody, oh, well, you're not suffering for the right reason. And because you're not suffering for the right reason, we don't have a place for you. Can you put the current migration of people from Central America in the context of other refugee movements um, to the US? People forget that we are a country of immigrants and that unless you're Native American, we are all children of immigrants. We're immigrants ourselves, or children, or grandchildren, or, or great-grandchildren of immigrants. Sure, so um, pre 
President Trump just announced that this year's refugee ceiling will be 30,000 people. Um, and that 30,000, it's unclear that we'll actually get to that number because that just means how many visas they're willing to grant. It doesn't include the fact that people are going through, really at this point, years of vetting before they actually get to the visa. Um, and so last year, our refugee ceiling was, I think, 40, 45,000, and we did not get to that number. Um, under, in President Obama's um, most, the, the year that had the largest refugee allotment was over 100,000. But in 1980, the U.S. took in more than 200,000 immigrants that year. And why did we take in that many? We took in that many for two reasons. One, um, because of the, the thousands of Indochina the, of um, Indo-Asian, Vietnamese, Caribbean, uh, sorry, Vietnamese, Cambodian, Laos, um, Hmong refugees, which had been, who had been displaced by um, wars that we participated in, in Southeast Asia, and the Mariel Boat Lift, um, Cubans coming um, to the United States because Castro said, if you want to leave, leave now, I'm not going to stop you, right? Um, countries all over the world are hit by refugee movements that are really, you know, have that, they come up, they're a crisis, they, they come up, people have to leave. Um, and when countries are hit by a refugee crisis, Jordan, for instance, has over 600,000 refugees at this point from Syria, but from other places in the Middle East as well, from Syria, from Iraq, et cetera. Lebanon has almost a million, 971,000. Turkey has 3.5 million refugees. And why do they have that many? It's because they're close enough for people to get to, and once they get there, the governments aren't thrilled about it, the people who live in those countries aren't thrilled about it, but you make a place for people who have nowhere else to go. The United States has been lucky enough that we have oceans around us. We have been insulated from a lot of these refugee movements, but now we have one at our southern border. People are leaving because they have no choice, right? And we have not been willing to think about what it means to have a refugee movement sitting at our border that we do not want to acknowledge. Ginger, what would you say to those who claim uh, aren't 30,000 enough? Why do we need to let them in? Why does the United States have the responsibility of accepting the people that are asking for uh, well, asylum? I mean, it's, I, I can say this, you know, we are signatories to international treaties that hold us responsible for not returning people who have a credible fear or a credible claim of being harmed if they're sent back home. I mean, it's just a matter of international law, and it's our, it's our obligation. We signed up for that obligation. And am I wrong, wrong on that? So we, we've signed up for this obligation, and as, as, as a part of that, then, we accept that we may have to take in more people than necessarily is comfortable, just like all these countries that, she ju that we just listed and just listed. And so, um, so I think it's a matter of, of our, you know, our international commitments. Do you want to weigh on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, in this particular crisis, I think that the United States bears some of the responsibility for it as well. Um, you know, uh, so a little bit of a, a history lesson. The uh, United States and its foreign policy and its immigration policies are partly to blame for what's spurring the, the exodus of people from Central America. Uh, during the 70s and 80s, the United States was very active in trying to thwart the advance of communism in Central America. Uh, that led to uh, high rates of violence and people fleeing Central America. Many of them end up in the United States. They end up in cities that had really bad gang problems. Um, in order to defend themselves, they formed gangs of their own. Uh, they were legal permanent residents or green card holders, but if they committed crimes and they went to prison, they were deportable. Uh, and when they land back in Central America, they don't have perhaps the command of the language. Uh, they're in a country that they're not familiar with, uh, but the one thing that they do have, the one resource that they have, uh, is this gang culture that they inherited in the United States, which so in effect we, uh, we exported 
to Central America. Now, again, you add that to this stew of really weak institutions, high poverty, uh, you know, a few job opportunities, um, I, and then uh, what has morphed into a monster of uh, 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 gang violence, um, extrajudicial killings, uh, and of course, uh, you know, that has spurred another wave of migration. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the United States, particularly in this case, is responsible to some extent for what we're seeing at our southern border. You're absolutely right. So when you hear uh, President Trump say, we need a wall, we need a wall around, on, on the border to keep MS-13 out, remember, they came from California, <laughs> uh, not from, from, from the south. Um, what was the next question I wanted to ask? About the same thing. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought with, with that. Um, the, the other uh, thing that they are accused of also in Central America is, or the U.S. is accused of in Central America, is uh, that we are the number one consumer of drugs, correct? What the Central Americans say is, you know, they put the users and we put the dead. Uh, we're the ones that are suffering the violence um, in Central America, in Mexico, in some parts of South America, while the United States is enjoying... Uh, this drug use and not really doing anything to fight it. Is that a, a valid excuse? I know for the special that you saw there, I interviewed the heads of state of Guatemala and Honduras, and that's exactly what they said. The, the U.S. has to help us because they're at fault, because they're not doing anything on drug consumption, and we are the ones that are suffering the violence here. Well, I think it, it, I think at least it needs to be part of the conversation, yeah. Um, I. I have a sense that the Obama administration at least attempted to recognize uh, some of the issues that the United States was responsible for. So uh, it had initiated this uh, Central American Miners Refugee Program. There were small numbers of uh, refugees that were able to, or people who wanted to apply to, uh, for asylum in the United States could do so in Central America. Um, Congress approved three quarters of a billion dollars for uh, improved governance and uh, programs to help reduce crime in Central America. So that's something of a recognition that uh, that we we own some of the responsibility, but but not this administration. But not this administration. Uh, President uh, Trump has ended that uh, refugee program and uh, funding for the Alliance for Prosperity in Central America has been slashed. Um, and that's just not a conversation that this administration wants to have. Right, Ginger, another one that's pointing the finger to Mexico is saying Mexico is not doing enough to stop the flow of immigrants from Central America. Is, you covered Mexico for many, many years. Uh, what is Mexico doing? Is Mexico doing enough? And well, is it Mexico's responsibility to stop immigrants from coming to the U.S.? Well, I think Mexico has gone back and forth on this um, issue. I think there was a time when Mexico basically gave immigrants at the southern border a kind of pass that they would use to cross the border and go into the United States. I think since Obama, the Obama administration began giving Mexico um, enforcement support and money and equipment to strengthen um, security along its southern border. And so Mexico, in fact, began to engage. And a lot of, you know, Mexico did this for many reasons. They are dependent on the U.S. for some kinds of security assistance, particularly security assistance in, in fighting the drug war. And in addition to helping um, Mexico fight its drug war, we asked Mexico to join us in the sort of fight against immigrants crossing into the United States. And so they have beefed up. And this administration has given them yet another tranche of money to increase their enforcement. And I've heard in recent weeks that not only is Mexico strengthening its enforcement against immigrants at the southern border, but has also begun sort of stopping immigrants once they reach the northern border from getting to the points of entry so that they can ask for asylum in the United States. So um, Mexico does a lot more. Mexico has its own problematic treatment of migrants who cross that country. Um, immigrant immigration enforcement officials who are responsible for all kinds of corrupt practices, um, criminal practices against immigrants in that country. So they have an immigration enforcement problem as well um, that often doesn't get talked about. 
Can you dispel the myth? I'm sorry, you wanted to Well, say I was just going to add that. that it's also important to remember that there are communities of Central Americans in Mexico, right. refugees who have gone to Mexico, refugees who are asking for asylum in Mexico, right. as well as people who have crossed the border illegally and have settled there. That's right. Can you dispel the myth that uh, Mexicans are the ones that are coming? Now, from what I understand, Mexicans are leaving the U.S., not coming into the U.S. Mexicans are still coming to the U.S., but I think what you're referring to is the fact that for the last several years, the number of entrances and the number of exits has been just about equal. Um, so the... One of the ways to think about this is that, you know, when Mexico's economy is worse, um, people leave. Um, but when America's economy is worse, people leave as well, right? Because they can no longer maintain themselves, and so they, you know, they go home. Um, and so those dual, um, those dual economic trends, um, both being able to... Um, find more better work in Mexico, but then also feeling like their opportunities are restricted here in the United States, you know, causes people to leave. Um, one of the, I, it's important to say too, I think, that it is much more difficult to be, to live an undocumented life in the United States now. And so people who have been here for 20 years, for 30 years, who own houses, who have sent their children, who have had children who are American citizens, who have sent their children to school, who are taking care of their grandchildren, you know, all of a sudden can discover that um, the fact that they've held a job and their employer's willing to speak up for them doesn't prevent them from being deported. Um, the fact that they, you know, are active in the local church helping other immigrants, that doesn't keep them from being deported. That a mistake 20, it it's, can even be true that if you have are in the United States illegally, you have made yourself known to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, that an immigration judge has given you permission to stay in the United States, not as an immigrant, but as somebody whose deportation is being withheld, we won't exercise the right to deportation immediately, can now be deported when they're going in for the regular check-in with Immigration and Customs Enforcement to ensure that they are continuing to obey the law. That's right. We have seen a lot of arrests in, in courthouses. Now, I think this is a good time for us to make that distinction of immigration policy and, and make the comparison of immigration policy under President Bush, under President Obama, and under President Trump. Now, the reason why I want to start with Bush and not Clinton, because everything changed after the, um, the attacks, the terrorist attacks in, in, in 2001, September 11th. Well, that's when ICE was created. That is when immigrants, no matter where they were coming from, were considered terrorists. That's when things changed for immigrants that were coming from south of the border. Can you explain the difference, all three of you, or any of you? So, so <laughs> no, 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 not over there. <laughs> um, I mean, you want to make that comparison, Ginger? My, my, I, I'm better probably with Obama versus Trump. Um, you know, after 9/11, there was, you know, the sort of crackdown at the border. Absolutely, there were. Um, um, it became much harder to get into the United States. That's when people started going through, you know, the desert, and we had the large numbers of people dying. Um, you know, I, I sort of, because I've been focused so much on um, family separation, I sort of think about it in terms of family detention policies and how each administration handled families. Um, you know, the Bush administration sort of did, was the first to do the kind of what, what some will call the catch and release. It, it sort of took families in, but then generally released them after a certain amount Right, of but time. they also approved the funds for building uh, a wall totally build or, the wall and, and totally increase more security boots on, on the, the ground Absolutely. and more technology on the border no doubt and then the obama administration sort of used this machinery that was built by the bush administration and sort of sent it into overdrive in the first couple of years of the administration and that's when the deportation numbers went through the roof 
Um, and he basically, you know, for the same reasons of deterrence, trying to <coughs> discourage people from coming, cracked down on enforcement. But he wasn't only picking up people at the border. There was family separation happening internally inside the country. So people who had gone back home for a visit but came back in that second or third time and already had kids in the United States, those people were getting sent back in large numbers um, under the Obama administration. And as far as family detention, that's where it was the Obama administration that was sued by the ACLU because it was detaining families for long periods of time in family detention facilities, including kids. And so under the Flores Agreement, a, a judge came um, Judge G um, ordered under Flores that children could not be detained for longer than 20 days. And that's that 20 day period that the Trump administration was required to abide by, which then they used to say, well, if we can't hold kids for 20 days with their parents, then we're going to separate the families. And so it kind of evolved in that way, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Aaron, you wanted to add to that? Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say um, a, a few of the changes that I saw. Uh, one, uh, the border towns on the Mexican side of the border uh, became uh, increasingly volatile. Uh, this is where uh, you find uh, thousands of immigrants that are at some point going to try to get across the border. Uh, perhaps they're going to uh, sneak across the border or they're going to uh, walk across a, a port of entry. Um, but again, because this is all controlled by organized crime, uh, these are very, very dangerous towns, particularly for migrants, because they are uh, easily exploitable. They don't have any resources there. Um, and then during the Obama administration, uh, when we saw these mass deportations, uh, people were deported to these towns. Um, and, and it's kind of hard to, to describe almost what that looks like. When you're being deported in the middle of the night uh, to a cartel-controlled town, um, there were mass kidnappings. I mean, a lot of this stuff doesn't get reported. It's, it's difficult to report. Um, but we know that it happened. Um, in fact, one of the examples that I gave earlier uh, about uh, board, uh, CBP officers telling migrants to go back to Mexico uh, I interviewed a woman who had uh, been coming up to the border in a van. It was maybe 17, 18 people in a passenger van. And about uh, 30 miles from the border, the van flipped. Several people died. Uh, she was taken to a hospital. Her uh, leg was pretty badly broken. Uh, and after several days in the hospital, all of the survivors were taken to a migrant shelter to convalesce. Um, she and all of the other survivors were still determined to get across the border. Um, she walks across the border, Border Patrol, uh, excuse me, CBP told her to go back to Reynosa, that was the uh, town on the Mexican side of the border, uh, where she was kidnapped. Um, and uh, as far as I, I happened to interview her mother, and her mother didn't know where she was either. Um, and then, you know, on the, on the U.S. side of the border, the way that the, so it, it was under the Bush administration that Operation Streamline was put in place. Um, and so, yes, uh, crossing the border uh, is a misdemeanor, but uh, repeat uh, or illegal reentry is a felony um, and is punishable by up to 20 years in prison. So if you go to almost any federal court along the border, uh, the front end of the judge's docket is filled with illegal reentry cases. Uh, you'll see 100, 150 people at a time, you know, the mass sentencings. I mean, that really started to ratchet up under the Bush administration and particularly under the Obama administration. We're seeing it again uh, with the Trump administration. The difference uh, with the Trump administration is that I started to see uh, parents that were standing up and asking a judge. Uh, I was separated from my son at the border, uh, or my daughter at the border, and the judge kind of shrugging his or her shoulders and saying, well, there's nothing that I can really do for you. Good luck. Um, you know, you're sentenced to three years in prison. Um, yeah, I mean, so it, it's kind of been each administration uh, and the policies of the previous administration has made the following administration possible, basically. Right. Now, we know that when, when the um, Bush administration had those walls built in part of the, of the border, especially in California, then what we saw is, is migrants trying to come in through Arizona, uh, through the desert. It was much more dangerous. There were a lot more deaths. 
so it's basically the militarization of the border and building a wall, the, is that the answer? Is that the solution? Clearly not. I mean, people are still mm -hmm. coming, right? Yeah. I mean, again, I, I just, I. It ha uh, it, yeah, it hasn't worked so far. No, it, you know, it hasn't worked <laughs> so, it's, so far. It's militarized. Is there a solution? Do you think that there is a humane solution to this problem? Um, I think the border question is slightly different from the, 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 refu the Central American refugee situation. Um, I mean, I will, this, I will be clear about this. Um, as both Ginger and Aaron have stated, um, border policy is tough. It is deliberately tough. It is meant to deter people from coming. Um, it is meant to, and it is unreasonable, I think, to think that under any administration, Republican or Democrat, um, that an, a, the administration would not want to make it difficult for people to come across a border where they're not supposed to come, right? But there are things you can do. People can come across the border asking for, for asylum, and you can say, we will give you a tether, an electronic tether, and we will you know, let you find your own way um, as long as you come back for your court trial, for your hearings, um, when you're supposed to. And we have done that, and the return rate of, um, of asylum seekers to these hearings is at 90%. I mean, mm -hmm. people, are, people do not disappear. People want to come back because they want, they hope that they will be able to get um, permission to stay in the US. Um, you can say to people, um, if you're going to come across the border, um, you can't come, you can't stay um, in the United States, but we can provide you temporary protection. And we have done that. We have provided over the years. We've created temporary protection for um, El Salvadorans, temporary protection for Liberians. Um, a lot of these temporary protected status, prote temporary protection programs um, are now being ended by the Department of Homeland Security. So while Ginger is telling us what she thinks could be a humane solution yeah. to this problem, I want you to start preparing your questions, or if you want to share a story, or if you want to make a comment, and the microphone is right there in the middle. So start thinking of your questions. And Ginger, what do you think is a humane solution to this problem? Well, you know, I feel like this is sort of out of my area of expertise and probably area of responsibility. I mean, I think as, as, as a journalist, it's like I, I can say that, um, you know, certainly what, what we're doing um, hasn't worked. Certainly what we're doing has had has caused harm to families who have who are crossing the border many of them because they have no real choice but to try to come here to make a better way for themselves um, I think that what Anne has said has you know seems to me like um, certainly solutions not only that they're not sort of pie in the sky there are things that we're already doing that seem to be effective they're just not the the sort of predominant part of our policy, like ankle bracelets for people who seek asylum, who will show up for their court hearings. Um, so I think it, it's not rocket science. I think there are programs out there that we have tried and that, that show some promise that could be sort of explored. So that's my way of we You know, you can also out. send your questions via Twitter, hashtag Wallace House. And for those who are watching live stream or for those who are here who are camera shy and would prefer to send the question via Twitter and not necessarily um, in person. Um, let's begin with the questions. Go ahead, introduce yourself, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, is this on? Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Hello, everyone. My name is Rebecca Ontiveros, um, and I'm an attorney at the Michigan Immigrant Rights Center. And I want to use this time to do three things. Uh, first of all, thank you, thank our panelists and our moderator for being here today, and really just for sharing your knowledge, your experience, um, and also just shedding light on this issue. I think we all have a, an important role to play in this immigrant rights movement, which I believe is the civil rights issue of our current day. So um, I really want to thank you and applaud you for, for being here today and sharing that with us. 
Um, second, I want to use this opportunity to really just give you guys an update um, here in Michigan and the status of child separation. Uh, and also um, motivate you for a call to action and something that you can do um, to help uh, during this time. So um, I'm a part of the unaccompanied children's team, so I represent the children that were separated from their parents and were here, placed here in Michigan. Um, I'm happy to say that you know we didn't lose track of the parents and the children, although it was very difficult tracking all of the parents in detention. As of a couple of weeks, we had about four children who were still um, still needed to be reunited with their parents, but the uh, immigration judge on those four cases granted voluntary departure uh, for the children, which means that they are able to depart. Now um, all that is needed is just the travel documentation uh, for, for the children uh, so they can uh, go back home. But um, I do want to point out that uh, many times after the children are uh, reunited with their parents, it's not necessarily then when uh, everything is fine. Um, there is a, a, a story of a six-year-old uh, girl, Guatemalan girl, that was featured on Univision, actually, Ana Yancy. And she is suffering from severe psychological trauma after being here in Michigan about three to three and a half months, um, then granted voluntary departure and reunited. She has severe PTSD and um, her parents just can't get through her and her family and her friends. Um, so I do want to point out that it doesn't always end right after they're reunited with their parents. And why is this important? It's very real that there is an attack by the administration on immigrant families and immigrant children. Um, and I think you and Ginger both talked about the Flores regulation. And um, right now, there, there's been a, a regulation that's been published. Right now, there's a comment period. It ends on November 6th. Basically, what is it allowing is allowing uh, the indefinite detention of children with their par parents while of the duration of the proceedings. So if you think about it, an asylum case can take, I don't know, three to five years, the children being detained with their families throughout the duration of that time. Um, and this runs contrary to the Flores Agreement, which you know, says the least restrictive setting um, doesn't only uh, allows for detention for 20 days, which is 20 days too long in my opinion, but uh, there you have it, this would allow for more. Um, anyone can comment, uh, so if you're interested in, uh, in commenting on that, come talk to me, I can give you resources, can give you templates, um, and that's something that you can do tangibly. If you have a sub subject matter expertise, if you're a psychologist, an educator, um, we, uh, I could work with you and, and tailoring. Thank you, thank you for way. sharing that information. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You. Next question. Do we have any Twitter questions? Yes. We have one Twitter question here, and then we'll go to you. We do. This one's directed towards Aaron Nelson and Ginger Thompson. What is the effect that private companies and industries associated with border militarization have on policy? Well, I will say that they, there's a lot of money to be made in immigrant detention, right? Um, where. Um, federal prisons, criminal prisons, sort of decided to, because conditions were so bad in many private prisons, um, the federal government got out of um, the private prison business. That's not the case with immigrant detention. Immigrant detention is still largely a private company um, enterprise, and, um, and um, you know, it, it the, does that money influence policy? Definitely. Those companies give lots of money to elected officials, lots of money in Congress, lots of money. I think um, the GEO Group was one of the largest sponsors of President Trump's inauguration um, um, party celebration. And so um, there, there can be significant influence on, on policy. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. Um, I'm thinking of a small town in uh, South Texas that had a uh, private uh, immigrant detention facility. Uh, and a few years ago, uh, the prisoners uh, had a riot. Uh, the place uh, burn didn't completely burn down, but it burned enough so that it was uninhabitable. Uh, and the company, private company, uh, decided to leave the town. Um, and this was a traumatic event for this small town because that was the industry. So, uh, you know, a lot of towns are uh, actively courting businesses uh, to put up their next detention facility in their town, uh, you know, as a job creator. 
Um, there are also uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know, military, uh, well, uh, Border Patrol has an expo every year where they're you know, promoting all of the, the new technology that they're selling. And then, of course, if they don't sell it to Border Patrol, they sell it to local PDs, they sell it to sheriff's departments. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's, it's big industry. Can I just say one thing on that prison? Is that Raymondville? Yep. So Raymondville burned down. It was a tent city, right? And tent cities just have this long, horrible history in the United States. They, they tend to be doomed from the beginning. Now we're holding children in tents for the first time in Tornillo. But Raymondville was so dependent on that tent city that when they left, there was such an outcry in town that, that now they've rebuilt yeah. a facility in Raymondville. It's not tents anymore. There's sort of hard structures. But that town wanted that facility. And their legislators got it back for them. So, so it's, it's important. It's all about money. Go ahead, sir. Hi, thank you for uh, speaking with us. My name is Joel, a senior studying business here at Michigan. And um, it, it was mentioned before, I believe, that um, you said that all illegal immigrants that are coming in are not rapists or not murderers. Um, there was a story about a month and a half a month and a half ago. Molly Tibbetts, a college student from Iowa, was killed by someone who was later determined to be an illegal immigrant from Mexico. So I'm, my question for you is, how can you confidently say to us that the illegal immigrants coming in, all they want to do is help their families and get a job and support their kids when events like these happen? And although it is just one example, I believe that one is far too many. Thank you. Right, it is one example, and if you remember her father saying, uh, I've met a, with a lot of these Mexican immigrants, and they're just Iowans with better food. Um, that's, that was his quote, by the way. That's exactly what he said. It, it's true. You know, I think that there are studies that have been proven. I'm answering it, and I'm not even a, a panelist. Answer. You're supposed to be no, answering answer. it. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I mean, it's been proven that in communities where there are um, high numbers of immigrants, the crime goes down. So the percentage is very, very low. And I know what you're saying. You're saying that one crime is too many, and if that person hadn't even been here, um, maybe that crime wouldn't have been committed. But then this is, this is what, I, what I wonder. When a non-documented immigrant um, kills someone, the headline is undocumented immigrant killed someone, or illegal alien, like they call them. When an African-American kills someone, a woman, African-American kills a woman. But when a white man kills a woman, a guy killed a woman, uh, a, a man killed a woman. I mean, honestly, um, it, 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 I think what you do is stigmatize uh, immigrants by referring to them every time that there's a crime. And the percentage of crimes committed by undocumented immigrants is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. Um, so, I would say that considering the thousands and thousands of immigrants that do come here, uh, that maybe there are some bad apples there. There's a lot of bad apples in this country, too, that we don't do anything about. You know, what do we do when, it, what do we do when there's a massacre? What do we do when there's a massacre? Talk about mental health, um, if it just happens to be someone that is not a minority. Anybody else want to weigh on that? Well, my thought is, um how could you ever, if, if everybody were to come here legally, uh, you can't possibly predict uh, which person may commit a crime, right? So what the, the kind of reverse of that argument would be, well, we shouldn't let anybody in because it's possible that maybe somebody would commit a crime. I, I mean, you don't make policy on exceptions, right? We, we don't sort of establish policy on an exception. We establish policies based on studies that say large numbers of people who are in this category are going to likely do this thing. And you can't say that about immigrants and crime. There's just, it, because there's no numbers to prove it or to support it. So if you came to me and said, you know, there are 100 people in this town and 100 undocumented immigrants and 87, 87 of them, which would be 87%, you know, were criminals or committed some crime or, you know, whatever, then, then we could talk about a policy solution. But you're talking about an exceptional case, and I don't see how you build policies around exceptions. I, I mean, we just, it doesn't, it, it's not, it doesn't make sense to me why, why we would do No, but that. thank you for your question. It's definitely a valid question. I Thanks. just want to thank the people behind me who booed when I was asking that question. 
No, very much. no, it's a good question. No it booing. is a good, it's question. a good question. It's a totally fair question. Any more Twitter questions? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so first, uh, thank you for your time. Um, and I have two quick points. The first one is connected to the uh, cap on refugees that I believe Professor Lynn mentioned. Um, that I, I just want to make the point that um, it's an extraordinary policy that, that, in my opinion, needs to change. Um, and it's something we all very much need to pay attention to. It's kind of been lost in the news cycle of Brett Kavanaugh and that crisis, um, in my opinion. Um, but but I, I spent the last year living in Jordan, and the impact that the refugee crisis has had on Jordan is very real. The impact that it has had on Lebanon um, is, is even more so, and uh, much of that impact is due to policies implemented by the United States government in the Middle East. Um, so that's, that's a very important point for us to focus on. Um, and then also, I'm interested in a more academic sense um, to understand your, your opinions on what might happen if the United States went for a policy of, um, of, of open, almost open borders where, where there is a security check at the border, uh, but no, no quotas. Um, no caps. What what do you what do you think would realistically happen? Um, so I should say that of course no country has an open border policy. We often talk about the 19th century in America as a time when anybody could come. You know anybody could come. But in fact, of course, we had Ellis Island and we had Angel Island, um, and we had restrictions at the border, and we also had state level restrictions. So I think and. I mean, the, uh, the example in our modern period is Europe, right, for which for many years Europeans had an open border for each other within the Schengen area where you went through border control when you went to one Schengen country but then moving from one country to another was not controlled by, uh, was no, there was no passport control for you and in fact um, the Schengen included um, what I think is absolutely necessary if you're going to have that kind of policy, which is not only was it possible for people to move across the border, it was possible for people to work legally um, in different countries. And, you know, if you, I think it's very clear that if you don't provide one, um, you have a lot of trouble with the other. Um, but I will, I, I think, I would actually go in a different direction and say to you that, um, the U.S. is facing an important humanitarian problem which, um, as you know, Aaron and Ginger have pointed out, is partly caused by you know, our history in that part of the world. Um, there's no reason, right, except our unwillingness to face it, that you couldn't have refugee camps in this, you know, in the United States or in Mexico that the United States helped to fund. That's a miserable policy. Um, it's miserable because refugee camps are, you know, general places where people cannot move forward with their lives, right? There, um, but, and, and, but in some ways the misery of that policy is the guarantee that people would not go unless they had to. Right, and that also then serves the deterrent function that um, you know that that we've talked about as you know necessary for border. And I will say the this is the other piece of it. People come because they think that it will be safer here than somewhere else. Right, if you make it completely safe to be here, that is in a sort of hypothetical open border situation, of course more people are going to come. It's ridiculous, why wouldn't they come, right? Um, and unless we are willing to, and that's not necessarily a bad thing either, but a, you would have to have a lot of other policy changes in our country in order to make it possible for people to come, because of course they would. I also think, Do we can have I just add to that, Maria Elena? I, I wonder if, you know, another thing that I think the Obama administration has tried and the Trump administration has rolled back on, and that is money for 
programs in Central America that might make life more bearable in Central America. You know, and even when Obama did some of this, um, you know, they didn't put very much money into it, and it took a long time for the money to get spent. And so, so it was sort of a half-started effort. But you know, if if the United States would put some of its money where its mouth is and, and do some things in Central America that would perhaps stimulate the economy, perhaps create a real education system, perhaps clean up some of the corruption in the police forces down there. It's a big, it's a big job because things are pretty bad off down there and institutions are very crippled and very weak, but perhaps those things would go a long way to stopping people from coming. And, and so then the idea of a refugee camp might not be such an urgent right. need. I, I right? think that everyone agrees that the best case scenario is that the conditions improve yeah. in Central America and in Mexico and all right. these other countries right. so that migrants right. don't feel the need to, to come right. to, to the US uh, in search of a better life. I think we have a Twitter question. Uh, Ginger and Aaron, yeah. you've been covering immigration for a very long time. Uh, what is one story that has really stuck in your head over the course of your reporting? Um, uh, one story uh, that, uh, and relevant to uh, our discussion about family separation, uh, about a decade ago, I met a Guatemalan woman um, who had been separated from her kids. So uh, during the Obama administration's mass deportations, uh, there were tens of thousands of parents who were deported uh, and they were separated from their kids. Um, often those kids would end up with uh, extended family, um, but uh, it wasn't uncommon for them to be put with a, a foster family. Uh, and in this one particular case, uh, the woman um, had crossed the border illegally. She was living undocumented in Nebraska and working in a, a meat packing plant. And she had two US citizen children. Uh, the youngest, uh, a girl, fell ill uh, and uh, Child Protective Services got involved. Um, they called uh, immigration authorities on her and she was arrested and she was deported. And she fought for her kids all the way to the Nebraska Supreme Court where the court decided that her decision to cross the border illegally uh, clearly made her an unfit parent. Um, and furthermore, to send her children to live with her in Guatemala was uh, an unfair disadvantage. Uh, so they decided to sever her parental rights. Um, now, in this particular case, she was fortunate only in that uh, she uh, managed to find pro bono representation um, and the case was reversed and she was reunited with her kids, but only after having been separated for uh, two, three years. Uh, she was returned to Nebraska and uh, you know, I met her during this process of uh, trying to become familiar again and sort of uh, rekindle that family atmosphere for her two kids who no longer spoke Spanish, uh, much less Quiche, which was the native language that she spoke. Um, and still, at the end of that process, immigration determined that she needed to go back to Guatemala. Uh, and she did take her kids with her. Um, but that, uh, that, that uh, story really sticks with me because, um, uh, you know, unlike the family separations that are getting so much attention, rightfully so, uh, now, uh, you know, these were uh, thousands of kids who uh, ended up with uh, American families um, that received very little attention. So I, I kind of reiterate the, this point that I made earlier is that our, our, immigra our immigration policies, our border policies in particular, but our immigration policies have long been uh, harsh and, and you might even describe them as being inhumane. Next question up there. Yeah. It's a known defect in how humans process information that an example like the Tibbetts case overrides our intellectual knowledge, our certain knowledge that the immigrants as a group commit fewer crimes. And the reason is fairly obvious on a personal level. I mislaid my driver's license for about six months and I drove without it. You could better believe I was obeying every traffic law I could find. The other thing um, is that it's unjust to deal with people because of a group membership in this fashion. There is one group 
which is known beyond a shadow of a doubt, to commit more crimes. Young men from ages 15 to 35, are we going to incarcerate them all? Thank you for your comment. Next question. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, there are a number of agencies involved in uh, the border crisis from this summer, whether that was ICE or CBP, DOJ, who was actually responsible for prosecuting, HHS, who was housing the children. So how um, does that complicate the situation in terms of uh, responding to the crisis and uh, developing an appropriate solution? And how does that impede our efforts to hold government accountable? Is bureaucracy to blame? Um, in this case, you might say that bureaucracy wasn't given the chance to work because one of the, as, as you've stated, there are a lot of agencies who are involved in um, this family separation issue. Um, but when the, when the Department of Homeland Security decided to move towards this zero tolerance policy, it didn't consult HHS and it didn't consult um, ICE and it didn't consult um, the, it, it, it didn't consult the sort of network of um, either at the detention center side, the companies that were running detention centers, or you know, on the public side, um, the state agencies that they would have to cooperate with. They thought that they, they did not realize and did not much, um, they did not realize and also did not really care that there are these downstream effects from the first actions that they took. And so, you know, the secretary of HHS was called in to explain how he was, you know, dealing with children um, that he was housing without any preparation, you know, for not, not only for the fact that he would be asked to answer the questions, you know, but without any preparation from his people um, to understand that, instead of housing children who were 15 and 16 and had crossed the border unaccompanied, he was now housing two-year-olds, right? One-year-olds um, who have an entirely different set of concerns and challenges and issues. Can I just say one thing for 10 seconds? So there was a recent um, hearing on the Hill where an HHS official who was charged with helping design the zero tolerance policy told CBP, this is going to traumatize children. Do you understand that? And CBP went ahead anyway. So they, they knew what they needed to do. They just didn't do it. Um, and there's a long discussion we could have about why. But. Yeah, and one, one last question. We have one last, thank you for your question. That was a very good question. And we have one last one. Hello. Hi, Hi. my name is Ariana. Um, I have a question about the law. Uh, what I'm confused about, you're talking about the difference between refugees and other immigrants, but isn't there a third category of refugee-like persons or like displaced persons? I thought according to like the Refugee Convention, there was a sort of like international commitment to non-refoulement of displaced right. persons. Mm -hmm. Right. So those are not just the refugees that are personally persecuted, but anyone who is fleeing from war or... Um, maybe general gang violence. And I'm just wondering, isn't the US in violation of international law, maybe on multiple levels here, in refouling these people who are displaced persons? Um, so, the, so the United States would say that they, have, that they have determined, that we have a process to determine, you know, A, whether somebody is claiming asylum legitimately, um, and B, if they don't have a legitimate reason for asylum, um, is there a reason why deportation should be withheld? Um, and if the person goes through those processes, um, then we, there, we are not in violation of international law because we have in fact you know, discovered that we have no obligation to this person under international law. So it is the existence of the process that insulates um, the United States and other countries. I mean, this is not a United States specific problem in other countries from, um, uh, from the criticism. 
So thank you so much for your question, for all your questions, uh, for listening to us. And I guess one of the most important things is that we wanted to start a conversation, not show that we are on one side or the other, but get you to listen to people who are experts, people who have been on the ground, people who are there to just give you the facts and help put things into perspective. And of course, the academic world who, who knows it all. <laughs> thank you so much. Lynette. Um, thank you to Aaron, to Ginger, to Anne, and to Maria Elena for moving the conversation along. It was such a complex conversation. When we were talking beforehand in our first organizing meeting about what we would do here, um, we talked about what is, what is the goal of the conversation? Where would we like to take people? Where would we like to end? And we very quickly realized that in a conversation like this, the goal cannot be to provide answers. Um, because we'd still be here tomorrow and we still wouldn't have real answers. And so the goal we decided on was to provide context, to provide um, true on the ground experience, to provide different points of view and to provide connections with the audience and to provide thought provoking points of view that hopefully will make you want to look into some of the things that you learned about today to find out more about the issues, to probe some of these angles more, and to figure out, as one of uh, the people who stepped first to the mic uh, proposed, figure out how you can participate in the conversation and toward getting to a place where, where there are some solutions that we follow through on. And so I really thank all of you for being here. The last thing I would say, we are Wallace House, we are a journalism organization, and so this may be obvious, but I'm, I'm going to say it anyway. We convene these conversations because we believe that journalism matters. Very simple, very simple fact, that journalism matters. And we, if, if we are to think about groups that are maligned and prosecuted right now, I think we have to say this out loud, that journalism matters, and the work that journalists do to provide context, to provide reporting, to provide facts, matters to our understanding of policy issues, to our understanding of people's lived experiences, and to our understanding of the world. And um, so we invite you to continue to participate in our discussions. They will always be framed around works of journalism with reporters, with experience in the subjects that we're talking about. And, and always with experts from the university to provide that cross context. We hope that you will stay after and talk to one another and to our panelists, and we look forward to seeing you again. To those of you who followed on live stream this entire time and shared your thoughts and questions, thank you as well for participating. Thank you.